with uh, Mr. Ranieri's uh, speech and after Mr. Banquero's uh, extremely interesting presentation, we have uh, come to the close of uh, the list of uh, speakers in uh, this morning's session on the art of shipping in the world we are in. And now we move to the, the panel discussion. We have uh, a number of uh, extremely uh, brilliant uh, uh, speakers, panelists, in uh, Giuseppe Bottiglieri, Federico Deodato, Mauro Iguera, Roberto Martinoli, Mario Mattioli, George Savliris, and uh, John Xilas in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, I will ask them either to ask uh, questions directly to the speakers of this morning session in case they have uh, pertinent questions to ask or to make their uh, comments within the context of uh, the theme of the session of this morning. Only that because we are run out of time, I would ask them to be as uh, short and to the point as much as they can. Thank you very much. We start with uh, Giuseppe Bottiglieri, please. Please, sir. Uh, if I may, I, sorry, I have a, since uh, Roberto Martinoli had to leave and Pepino is chairing the young people session of this afternoon with the president of the young ship owners, Andrea Garolla. Uh, uh, and I know that Pepino wants to say something also in this session. He will also speak in place of Roberto, who had to, to take a plane back to Genoa. Yes, good morning to everybody. Good morning to chairman. We are, uh, I thank you very much to Mr. Lauro for uh, this uh, organization and uh, for the invitation they give me to participate at this conference. Very interesting, all speakers, I know they have made some new efforts to understand better the shipping situation and what is going on. Very important what say Mr. Hugo Salerno that uh, at uh, the end of his speech he said that the best way to predict uh, is to invent. And uh, I am agree with Hugo because many, many, everybody will try to give always an explanation of what is going on, but it's always very, very difficult. Uh, every time we try to, to make uh, some uh, uh, something new or to claim uh, uh, some other prospects, maybe we are wrong. The last one was the impossible to predict that the tankers industry is growing so well that VLCC today are running at $120,000 a day. Nobody was able to predict such a so big increase. As well, nobody is going to predict so very low freight rates in the dry cargo system, dry cargo shipping. The next step, what will be? We have to assist at laid up of dry cargo vessels. Maybe we are very, very, very soon approaching. Still today, the market is losing points and points. And the community of ship owners of dry cargo vessels are fighting in a situation in which they are unable to, to, to fight against charters because this is now the real situation. It's a, a continuous day by day fighting in which from one side the charters, they have their cargos, they know how many cargos are in the world are in the, in the desk. They open the desk, one by one they put in the market. On the other side, they know exactly where are our ships, their position, where they are going, and uh, they have uh, also organized through brokers, most important brokers, they do this. There is one desk looking how the world fleet is moving from one hemisphere to the other one, and uh, predicting how many ships are moving uh, 
in the next 30 days and then to give uh, information to charters. And therefore, it's very easy to play the card in the FFA market in the future in about 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days. They are very able to do this. And therefore, this is a very a situation in which we are trying now, thanks to projection of also made, uh, I see the slide of Hugo Salerno, in which uh, there is a, a uh, Russia going down 3.8%, Brazil minus 3.4%. You know, this is a very bad news that on which we are assisting. A part of the China, that China is still 6.8%, uh, is still okay. It's not enough, but uh, the other countries are losing heavy percentage of GDP. Therefore, I think, uh, concluding that uh, the shipping industry is receiving uh, very good signals from the fact that uh, private equity, each funds in this moment, they are out of the system. They are reluctant to invest much more in, in this uh, dry cargo system rather than maybe tankers, in which they are still looking to invest in the tankers. For uh, private equity or especially hedge funds in which they are holding so big a quantity of money, for them the investment in the shipping, uh, in the ships, is very good because they have one ship with a high intensive capital. They invest $100 million in, uh, for one asset only. They are able to uh, control this asset all over the world, therefore it's very cash going around the world in the globalization, and uh, uh, they can sail at any time they want to do, and they manage with a flag of a convenient and uh, to get money through uh, other companies uh, uh, that are escaping uh, taxation and so on. Therefore, it's very good business for rich funds. But now, in this moment, they realize that to do this every time and to invest so big amount was going, uh, they at the beginning, they start, okay, we buy, we sell. For us, 3% is okay, but 3% uh, of interest on the money spent is okay, but now it's not enough anymore. If they invest in the dry, they lose money. If they invest in the tankers, they are afraid to lose money because the prices are very high. This is what we are now, but always very difficult to predict the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bottiglieri, on, uh, for your remarks on uh, the state of uh, the shipping markets nowadays and also for uh, keeping your intervention as, as uh, short as possible. Much obliged. Uh, Mr. Deodato, please. Thank you very much for all you, all you said. Very interesting. Uh, it's been very difficult to, for me to work out what question, if any, uh, I would ask. So I decided to do two things. One, to first of all, congratulate uh, Dileta for the passion she's put in there, because her presentation was great. But apart from that, it was clear that, that there was passion behind it. And this is leading, I've elected to avoid any question in relation to shipping, but perhaps uh, I was fascinated by the speech of uh, Professor Dalimonte. Uh, he has depicted a very clear picture of what has been happening in the past years. In a nutshell, you have told us where we are and why we are there. <clears throat> My question is, you said it's difficult, of course, to change the state of the, state of the heart of the situation. Machiavelli said it initially, as you said. Um, apart from making the, the decisions of uh, wanting to, 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 to go for a change, uh, clearly it is necessary to have the support of people behind changes which are being suggested, I guess. You said, say, the European population is pretty 
is pretty skeptical from the say that it, we see it every day say you, you watch on the TV and you see uh, how skeptical is the population so I think for implementing big changes you need also to have a common challenge or a common danger or a common fear or something which is going to create a sort of mm, now avoiding to get into nationalism which I don't think we anybody want to see this again what you, in a nutshell what do you think could be a proposal for the European population meaning give a common target, a common challenge to the European population to overcome this moment of skepticism. This is Mr. Poulson, not Mr. Dalimonte. Yeah, that's all right, that's fine. Uh, Professor Dalimonte, where are you? Ah, he's there, he's there. You can answer the, the question, please? You, you can, from, from, from there, there, from there, yeah. Uh, the question you raise is a very important question. Uh, I finished my, spe my speech before appealing to the prince or the princess that would uh, show Europe the way to go. We need leadership. I am, at the end, I'm not so pessimistic because the state of European public opinion is very volatile. Look at what happened in the last few weeks vis-a-vis -vis the refugee crisis that uh, the letter uh, presented so well to us. It took one picture, the picture of one boy who died at sea, to change the perception and the policies. Maybe for a short period of time, we don't know. But the situation is so volatile that if we find the kind of leadership that we need, there is an opportunity to create the consensus at the mass level that you have suggested. Because you're absolutely right, the process of European integration so far has been an elite-driven process. In order to introduce the new order of things, we need public opinion behind it. The elites are not enough. Leadership is essential, but leadership has to be exerted by bringing the people together. I think that it's possible. I think I'm not pessimistic about it. Uh, the, the, the fact that millions of people are looking at this refugee crisis, uh, these problems that it's on, on our doorstep, and they realize that only Europe together a united Europe, not single countries, but a united Europe can give a common response to these kind of problems. I think this is the kind of learning process that will provide the opportunity to build a consensus for moving forward. I, I, <clears throat> I see Mr. Deodato nodding. I take it that you have found, you have found the explanation by Professor Darimonte to your satisfaction. Thank you very much. We move to the next, uh, the next panel. I think jo jo John Liras want to add a word. I, I, I'd like to add something here because it's not a strictly maritime question that was asked, but it's very important. And uh, coming from a country that's very beleaguered and has been in the kind of spotlight for all its problems uh, for the last seven years, and even created a drop of Wall Street at uh, some point, which I found quite amazing, a little country like Greece with the economy that is 0.2% of global GDP. But anyway, the recent elections in Greece we were discussing with Professor Dalimonte yesterday are very indicative of what he said about the fact that there is skepticism about Europe, but people want to be in Europe. And so this is a kind of contradiction that might be not so difficult to explain. But I think that policymakers, especially ones with white hair or without hair, like myself, should take into account, especially because of the younger people like Diletta, which I don't think we know enough about what they, their perception of the European Union is and what they think should happen to, in the European Union, what, what, should be, uh, what, what, what prospects they would like to see 
um, you know, uh, appear in the, U in the European Union. And I would like to give an example from shipping because I think it is a very good example. I said this yesterday. Ours is a, still a people's industry. It is not an industry where people are being replaced by technology. I think this is the trend in the world and it may not be the right thing. But anyway, our business has managed over the centuries and over the last half of the two, last century, which was so traumatic for humanity, to remain a people's business and to remain essentially entrepreneurial. We have also the Linus business and the Linus sector and others that are very corporate and very concentrated. But I think this combination is what we should be looking for in Europe. We should, be, we should allow entrepreneurial um, activity and, and the entrepreneurial spirit, which I think is being killed by too much bureaucracy and too much regulation. And at the same time, we are going to have the corporate sector as well. But at the moment, people don't know about the other side. The whole agenda is driven by the corporate sector. All the articles are about the corporate sector. All the information is about the corporate sector. Because my firm is a, is a private business. Nobody is going to report on my firm. No economist, no sort of economic journal, whatever. But it's still 60 or 65 percent of GDP in Europe comes from the private uh, companies that are not quoted. So to conclude two things, let's ask the younger people what their vision of Europe and secondly, let's not kill human endeavor and entrepreneurial spirit. Thank you, Yanni, for your uh, intervention. Dileta, do you want to come in? Uh, vision for Europe? If you please. <laughs> wow, it's a huge question. I don't know, I think young people, maybe there is a contradiction there as well because we we really embrace mobility and moving you know I'm Italian and I live in the UK so I think for me seeing a united Europe where you can seize the opportunities that you have is, is, is very important but you also we are a generation that has been a bit excluded from the the democratic process of Europe so I think uh, the future of the European Union should try to exactly include also the public and the younger generations who have been no very part of the process of setting up uh, the idea of a European Union, also beyond um, common market, but for a more, for a stronger political Europe. And I think for that, it's quite interesting to see the connection between the European and so transnational level and the local level in cities, in big multicultural cities like London and Paris and, and Rome. So that's my idea. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Let's move on. The next uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Mauro Iguera. Would you please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, let me join everybody else in congratulating to Francesco and his associates for the beauty of the location, the profile of the speaker, and really the quality of the audience. It is a great success so far. Um, and my question is in between Mr. Poulsen and uh, Mr. Liras, and, uh, because it has happened to me a few years ago to uh, pay a visit uh, with the Deputy Minister of Merchant Marine of Singapore to some of international ship owners and I noticed that actually, I mean, you from Singapore, you move like a corporation in a way. This, uh, I mean, uh, very knowledge lady, I mean, was attracting, was trying to attract international ship owners to move the, their headquarters to Singapore. And I'm sure that uh, in the recent years, due to the ups and downs of uh, Greece as a country, it's uh, not as a shipping community that's still dominant worldwide, uh, that must have been one of the targets of Singapore, uh, try to attract Greek in Singapore. Has that been successful at all, or, I mean, Greece will continue to be mainly Greek-based? Shall I start? Oh. John? Okay, I'll, I'll, st I'll, I'll start. Um, I would say that it is quite correct, uh, both Hong Kong uh, and Singapore have sent uh, for want of a better word, marketing teams to, uh, to, to Greece because they, of course, are following developments carefully. But my own impression is that these efforts will be very limited. I, my impression is that um, the vast majority of Greeks would, if they are going to leave Greece, they would go initially to, to Cyprus, and I think there's evidence to this. Uh, I know that Vancouver and Dubai and uh, other, other jurisdictions are also trying to entice Greeks on shore, but I, I suspect that they are more comfortable st staying in the beautiful Mediterranean than uh, going to the other side of the world. 
and I just don't think it's so much in their, in their makeup and nature to, uh, to, to move to Asian. Some have done it, a few have done it already, but that's, a, that's some time ago. So my own guess is it's not going to be, um, if, if it's going to be anything, it'll be a very limited. Yanni, would you like to participate in this highly hypothetical academic discussion? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Thimio. Um, I, I, um, I comprehend and endorse your irony. Um, I think that uh, Esben is right. We want to remain in Greece. Um, it's, it's interesting to note that historically Greek shipping was not in Greece. Uh, after the Second World War and the whole sort of uh, what we call the shipping miracle because uh, our uh, cargo fleet was destroyed during the Second World War and it came back from zero to be the leading nation today. Uh, we want to stay in Greece. We, we started going back in the 80s after the dictatorship of the 60s, which was a remarkable uh, distortion uh, for Europe. You know, we were the uh, country with, uh, which gave <coughs> democracy to the world, and we had a dictatorship in the 60s. But um, what is important is what has been, uh, has been uh, um, underlined and emphasized as the success of Singapore, which is stability of the framework, both uh, operational and, of course, taxation, for shipping to remain in Greece. And uh, we are optimistic. We think that despite the current problems and all the kind of pressure that exists on uh, Greece in, uh, I think, a one-dimensional um, view, which is not correct. You can't tax the, a reducing, you know, cake, if you like. Uh, the material that you tax, if it's reducing because there's no growth, is not going to solve the problem. But this, unfortunately, is the policy that we are being asked to apply by the, um, m the people who are monitoring Greece for, because of the debts. So, uh, but we are optimistic that we will be able to stay in Greece, and we want to stay in Greece. And as um, Hugo said, or Esben rather, if, you know, uh, people uh, are thinking, uh, and they are, obviously, because we are international businessmen, of a plan B, then probably Cyprus is on top of the list. Thank you. Okay, I think this uh, topic uh, is, is now over. I would like to introduce also an, another very old and young friend of mine, uh, uh, l'armatore Pepino D'Amato, uh, who is one of the most conservative ship owners I know, and uh, he has got also a very long experience of shipping. Uh, I think he wants to say something to all of us. <coughs> Dunque io devo dare una risposta a Federico Deodato da un anno perché l'anno scorso gli fece una proposta, lui rispose, ma quando rispose io non c'ero, quindi non potei dire quello che io volevo dire. Ad ogni modo sappiamo tutti che quello che affligge più di tutto attualmente è la crisi dei noni, specialmente per il carico secco. Ora, la crisi attuale, io che ne ho vissute tante di crisi, quella attuale è ben diversa dalle precedenti. Chi ha volato su Pireo negli anni Ottanta per alcuni minuti vedeva sotto centinaia e centinaia di navi ferme legate puppe e prua in disarmo. Attualmente non abbiamo nessuna nave in disarmo. Perché? Perché il nodo è così basso se i carichi ci sono per tutti? Perché specialmente i cinesi hanno comprato e stanno comprando tutte le navi che andavano in demolizione, pagando 3 milioni. L'equipaggio cinese costa la decima parte di quello che costa a noi. Quindi qualsiasi nolo lo possono accettare. Allora, la proposta che io avevo fatto l'anno scorso a, a Federico Deodato era di intervenire in qualche modo 
E la cosa migliore, eh, questo signore a fianco a me dice che sono un sognatore, e da sognatore avevo fatto la proposta, e la continuo a fare, perché bisogna eliminare queste navi vecchie, sono quelle che portano il mercato giù. Allora gli ha detto, ma perché i sindaci, i, i PNDI eh, non si mettono d'accordo fra di loro, specialmente perché i PNDI sono quasi tutti a Londra e sono collegati fra di loro? Se non coprono più queste navi vecchie, allora le eliminiamo. Questo è il modo. Potrebbe essere anche, per esempio, gli istituti di classificazione, però è ben difficile perché sono, sono sparsi un po' in tutto il mondo, come pure le compagnie di, di assicurazione corpo e macchina. Però il sindacato, a mio avviso, sempre da sognatore, è più possibile, proprio perché la maggioranza sono, dei, dei club sono a Londra e perché sono collegati fra loro. Tenendo presente che il danno che avviene all'armamento mondiale si ripercuota anche su, 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 su PNI, sulle assicurazioni, eh, forse non tanto, anzi forse il, gli istituti ci guadagnano perché queste navi vecchie hanno più danni e quindi danno più lavoro a, a, ai, ai registi navali. Quindi io rinnovo questa proposta che fece allora e naturalmente quello che non fui in grado di dire perché non c'ero quanto tu mh, intervenissi è che si dovete essere tutti assieme perché naturalmente diciamo Gigi Aponte che ha 200 navi ne ha 30 vecchie voi non potete eliminarle le vecchie e perciò, ma se tutti quanti stabilite proprio per regola che oltre una certa età le navi non devono essere più coperte e allora risolviamo il problema perché, ripeto ancora una volta, sono queste navi che portano giù il mercato. E io non vedo se non si trova questa soluzione, una soluzione che potrebbe anche essere un'altra, di eliminarle, noi peggioreremo. Perché, come diceva Lorenzo Banchero, abbiamo prossimamente 1500 book nuove. E questo è il primo. Attualmente, ripeto, tutte le navi trovano i carichi, però il nodo è basso perché... È possibile anche con 3.000 dollari le vecchie navi che costano 3 milioni, l'equipaggio cinese per esempio non costa quasi niente, allora possono anche accettare 3 milioni, anche guadagnarci. Mentre una Panamax che è stata costruita negli anni scorsi ha bisogno almeno di 15.000 dollari per poter pagare tutto. Vi ringrazio. Can I? Grazie Peppino. Uh, I'm, I'm so, in Italian. Eh? Yeah. Called in by Peppino, right? Yes. You, you, you owe him a brief. No, but, uh, sai, il problema, cioè, sappiamo tutti che il problema esiste. Eh, purtroppo il prendere decisioni comuni. Io, non, io lavoro con il sistema dei clubs, ma non sono un club. Prendere decisioni comuni di questo tipo oggi nel, nel, nell'ambiente soprattutto eh, molto regolamentato sotto un profilo della non competizione e eh, di altre potrebbe mh, essere difficile. Eh, penso che siamo tutti d'accordo che già il sistema dei club è un po' sotto accusa per essere visto quasi una sorta di cartello. Mm, se ci si muovesse in una certa direzione credo che potrebbe eh, diventare un problema. D'altra parte diciamo, una sorta di eh, azione in questo senso avviene ed avviene naturalmente in quanto eh, tutti i clubs, ma credo che anche tutti gli assicuratori, poi Mauro magari mi aiuti su questo, eh, stanno dando, prestando molta più attenzione al discorso dell'età della nave nel momento nel quale si deve considerare un rischio o quotare un rischio o dare un prezzo. Um, quindi in qualche maniera e per quanto possibile all'interno di un, un ambiente che deve rimanere comunque competitivamente libero eh, qualcosa si sta cercando di fare sicuramente eh, si è fatto qualcosa, forse non abbastanza mm, c'è stato un periodo nel quale si sono anche inaspriti molto i controlli sulla qualità della gestione sulla qualità delle navi stesse eh, noi vediamo in maniera molto comune oggi la richiesta di ispezioni, non solo delle navi ma anche di chi di ispezioni, di quantomeno di verifica di quello che è il livello di gestione. Quindi qualcosa si sta facendo in questa maniera. 
io francamente trovo molto difficile che sia possibile mettere una, una barriera, cioè noi abbiamo questo tipo di esperienza per esempio nel passato nelle, nelle polizze merci dove c'era semplicemente un sovrapprezzo nel momento nel quale veniva trasportata la merce su una nave eh, di una certa età, ma quella poteva essere la risposta che veniva data, cioè un sovrapprezzo, rendere meno competitiva eh, questa, questa nave. Vedo difficile, diciamo, da parte dell'assicuratore, eh, appunto, che deve dimostrare comunque di lavorare in ambiente libero eh, di, di competizione, che questo possa avvenire. Informalmente credo che tutto questo tipo di problematica che tu correttamente eh, sottolinei, tutto, tutto il sistema sta cercando di, mettere, di porre rimedio a questo. Io credo che la classe stia facendo qualcosa in questo senso, gli assicuratori corpi stanno facendo qualcosa in questo senso, i P&I stanno indubbiamente facendo qualcosa in questo senso e ci stiamo tutti muovendo più o meno nella stessa direzione per in qualche maniera rendere meno competitivo l'utilizzo di questa tipologia di tonnellaggio. Eliminarla io francamente non vedo come sia possibile eh, riuscire, come giustamente dicevi tu, in maniera un po' da sognatore, ma che la vedrei anch'io, è una soluzione molto semplice. Mettiamo un limite di età, arrivederci e grazie. Eh, non, non, non vedo come questo possa avvenire, mentre vedo... Certo. Lo... Assolutamente. Assolutamente, assolutamente, assolutamente. Non so, Ugo, Mauro, avete... Io... Posso intervenire? Peppino, facciamo intervenire prima. Peppino, poi faccio un commento anch'io. Eh, Peppino, questo tuo tema che io ricordo quando l'hai posto, purtroppo è impraticabile. Io sono membro dello UK Club, sono board member da 13 anni. Ti posso dire che questa faccenda delle navi vecchie eh, è, un, è un tema che sta molto a cuore ai P&I Club, non solo allo UK. Si è discusse diverse volte di ringiovanire la flotta, cosa che stanno facendo ovviamente, ma mettere delle limitazioni su delle navi che sono classificate regolarmente è praticamente impossibile. Le iniziative non possono partire dai P&I Club perché eh, diciamo che se una nave, seppure vecchia, è mantenuta bene e classificata regolarmente è un tema che non possono affrontare. Pagherebbero qualcosa in più di premi ma non possono mettere un veto. Quindi è un tema veramente a cuore ma non c'è nulla da fare. Non è questo il sistema per risolvere questo problema. Scusa ma in effetti... Alcuni governi non accettano più navi oltre una certa età, per esempio se non sbaglio la Liberia non prende più navi eh, superiori a 20 anni, quindi si tratta di fare un regolamento in base al quale le navi a una certa età non devono più navigare, sia in buone condizioni o in cattive condizioni, questo è quello che si dovrebbe fare, ma perché non, non, non può essere fatto per esempio dal, da tutti i clubs del PNI? Perché? Uh, th thank Posso. you very much. Just a few words from Ugo and uh, we have to move on because we are uh, running out of time. Ugo, please. Uh, I don't know if I have to answer in English or Italian. Peppino, do you have... C'è la traduzione? Sì. È la traduzione. Okay. So, let me ask. Uh, uh, the, the only... And it is not a matter to discharge responsibility to others, but the only uh, entity that can take such type of decisions are the regulators. No other private entity like CLASS, like underwriters, like P&I, can decide to regulate the market and put out of the market vessels. What we can do as CLASS, and we are doing, is to be careful in controlling these vessels And this immediately makes the competitiveness of old units less uh, uh, efficient, let's say, less effective, because the cost of maintaining properly an old unit is generally higher than the cost. But we cannot take a decision uh, for which we decide that above a certain age units cannot be classed. The only part, the only entity that can take this decision, uh, uh, Timio, the, the reason why I was... Uh, 
Francesco, you are not interested in this topic, I see. <laughs> Clearly. Uh, I would like to speak with serious people uh, like Timio. Uh, Timio. Uh, he, he was saying that... Uh, to your it's question, time to go to lunch. No, he was saying <laughs> that to your question, the answer was yes. But what was really the question? The, the question was the one put by... Uh, Peppino, the, the two Peppino. Uh, go so, ahead, go ahead. Is, uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, I no, think no, I, I was saying that this is probably a problem that can be uh, faced more by the organization like IMO that uh, this is one. TBO what I was has, mentioning. Has, has been uh, handling so well for so many years, but obviously this is a political organization like the United Nations. The, the, the and only so one, there are political yeah. problems with the states. The only one out. that can take these decisions are the regulators. The regulators uh, for shipping are in IMO. So the only entity that can take uh, such a decision are the uh, governments, the politicians, the regulators which are sitting in IMO, I think. So it's great that we are all of the same opinion. The problem of Pepino exists uh, and should be uh, in some way handled. Uh, 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 the place to handle it is probably not the P&I clubs and uh, the, the, the London the, the insurance market. Uh, it's uh, IMO, but uh, has many problems that affect uh, the world. Uh, you know, to, to, unfortunately, there's needed a certain political support, and unfortunately, this takes too much time uh, to, to change the regulation. I think you said. Mr. Dalimonte said that uh, you know putting a new order in place is one of the most uh, difficult and dangerous and uh, I would say uh, exercise but also patient exercise. Uh, I think my time, my patience is not enough though I wouldn't be a good uh, politician and a good diplomat just because of this little failure of my personality. So. I can thank you, Pepino, for your contribution. If I can, we will discuss this in looking to the future that you'll chair this afternoon. Perhaps the young ship owner will come with new uh, ideas, since there are already uh, some of them are uh, even better than the old ship owner. I'm not a ship owner, I'm just old, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, and not, notwithstanding the, the fact that I've got a, 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 a cousin who is also a very good friend, who is Mario Mattioli, who is a ship owner, so I will not entertain you to, to, to say all the classes of the tonnage, uh, type of tonnage, classes of uh, business he is involved or he has been involved that vary from uh, gas to tankers to bulkers to uh, to offshore vessels, he still uh, is very involved in, I think, in Libya, and he probably would like to talk about this. I would like to mention something I found in his background that uh, uh, makes uh, drive me back to to my grandmother, surname. He he was uh, uh, been working up to 1997 with Chidi ship, which is a, a surname that. Uh, uh, is, is very important uh, for me, so I will have this such a good friend speaking. I think going back to some of the problems of the Mediterranean uh, that we have discussed in the earlier part of this morning. Please, Mario. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you for the organization and thank you for uh, uh, the fact that as a Neapolitan, I have discovered yesterday a fantastic location. And so I, I am living in Naples. I knew about the museum, but I honestly had no ex possibility to visit it. So you are uh, always uh, fantastic in this kind of organization. And this is uh, I mean, uh, something that I say as a Neapolitan, proud to have these people visiting uh, locations that uh, are difficult also for us. Any case. Uh, starting, uh, uh, thank you for your introduction, um, and uh, yes, I think that I was uh, extremely uh, impressed by uh, the speech that uh, Dileta has done. I, I, I have to say that I've also asked her to uh, give me her paper as well as uh, uh, 
the presentation uh, because uh, we will have on the 27th uh, a conference in Confitarm about uh, uh, migrants uh, and uh, uh, I've, uh, I've become a sort of expert about migrants, unfortunately for me, I have to say, because I would like to be recognized as a ship owner and not as a solver of lives that doesn't, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, do nothing else than uh, giving a, an ethical and a moral uh, help uh, to really very, very poor people. But uh, starting from this, I think that uh, it is important to, see that, uh, to say that uh, uh, this is a, a huge problem. It is affecting uh, really uh, the, uh, the, the transportation in the Mediterranean. Uh, I don't want to enter into any political issue because everyone has got his uh, point of view. I think that, uh, uh, in my opinion, we have helped in an unbelievable way to increase uh, the uh, traffic of migrants and uh, starting from, uh, unfortunately, from the Italian policy that has been to go as, as close as possible to the Libyan borders with uh, not only the few warships but the lot of merchant ships that were uh, transiting in the Mediterranean, we have helped and we have given a lot of money to the smugglers. So this is uh, my personal point of view and I am against uh, the fact that we have uh, given assistance up to 20, 25 miles from the African coast because, uh, as I say, this has increased a lot the numbers of migrants, it has increased a lot the uh, illegal cost, and I think that, uh, honestly, what should be done is something on site, on ground, at the, uh, uh, in those countries, avoiding uh, this uh, 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 amount of people. Then uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, uh, an ethical and a moral problem. Uh, the, this is what has always been told uh, by my masters uh, that, 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 that are there. I've got offshore vessels. They are working uh, in uh, oil fields in the north of Libya. They are exactly on the route from uh, uh, the, the, the place of Zawiya, that is the one where most of the migrants uh, starts their uh, terrible voyages and is exactly in the north, 60, 60 miles north, there are uh, our uh, units that are uh, working uh, on, the, on the oil rigs down. The problem, uh, so for this reason, uh, I am contacted, I'm quite famous as well as in the, in the, in the, in the Coast Guards because they know perfectly uh, the ships. Uh, the, the, there has been uh, a government uh, meeting in which they were thinking, because my vessels are called uh, with, uh, with numbers, they, they, they thought that they were military ships, that they realized that they are not military ships, but they are merchant ships. By the way, um, the real problem is when there is the approach with migrants that uh, that uh, is terrible in the sense that no one will ever look at the safety of the ship, but everyone is uh, trying to do its best in order to save lives and sometimes uh, creating uh, a lot of problems to the ship itself, to the cargo itself, or eventually. Uh, just, just to say, one, one time we have uh, had 1,350 1, people in one shot. Uh, three days uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, the port of uh, uh, Augusta. So we had to keep on board of our ship, that is a PSV, 75, uh, 77 meters length, 16 meters uh, uh, um, of, of beam. So a small ship, a small ship. We had on the deck 1,350 people with 11 people of crew. crew. So this means that uh, there is more than 100 person per uh, crew member. This means that we have no means at all in order to do that. We have, of course, uh, not so much uh, food on board. We don't have any doctor. So it's really an unbelievable thing. I have to say that uh, with uh, this year, with uh, the Triton operation, with the fact that Europe has uh, increased uh, uh, there has been a, 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 has increased the quality of the ships that have been put there because they are not only warships but they are also ships that are uh, um, uh, really well equipped in order to give a proper assistance. So I have to say that in these last months our experience is that at least in our case we have reduced a lot the number of calls and we have been called only 
in order to uh, make a sort of assistance uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, during uh, the, the proper intervention. So from this point of view, there has been uh, a great uh, uh, relief from the uh, merchant, uh, merchant ship. Uh, so this is my experience, uh, and, uh, and I said uh, I've appreciated a lot the, 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 the speech of Diletta and also her fluency in English that is absolutely great, so very, very good. And uh, then the, the, there is a lot to say, by the way. I appreciate that we are getting to the lunch time, so I will stop. Everybody has said a lot. Uh, the only thing that I want to say on top of that is that uh, uh, I agree entirely with uh, the, the, the Peppino D'Amato, with the fact that uh, really this is a terrible market and that should be done something, uh, but uh, I uh, think that uh, what should be done more is from the charter, charter's point of view, because uh, uh, Peppino is right, uh, uh, we should try to reduce the number of ships, but uh, at the end of the story, what is uh, true is that we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, bureaucracy, we have uh, a lot of uh, costs that are increasing, uh, we are seeing that there are systems that are not able to give the proper certification and the fact that there is an enormous increase on bureaucracy means a lot of costs and I wouldn't uh, like uh, to see a Volkswagen case uh, within the shipping industry because at the end of the story the way of avoiding uh, uh, that uh, is that uh, we may find someone who has Turn, turn the obstacle rather than jumping it. And so we have really this overruling is something that should be very, very taken into account from the different associations of ship owners as well as with the help of IMO in order to reduce and look at the real substance rather than looking so much to papers and to silly things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Uh, is, is Joe? He left. Uh, so, is the, will you introduce John Xila's uh, intervention? <laughs> yes, of course I just will. Hand, hand over to him. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. No, no, I, I just want to praise him because after two uh, aborted landings of his plane at Fiumicino, he managed to come, and we are delighted to, to have him here with us. And it's with great pleasure that I give him the floor. Mr. Xilas, please, the President and CEO of the Ariston Navigation Corporation. Yanni, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitropoulos. And uh, thank you, Francesco, for organizing this. Um, it's always difficult to speak the last one before lunch. I guess everybody is uh, hungry by now. Uh, we've heard uh, so many distinguished uh, speakers, all experts in their field. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by that, and uh, I don't have too much to add, really. Overwhelmed also by the venue, which is fantastic. Uh, one uh, only small comment I would make uh, regarding, uh, you know, in shipping we have felt the pain of regionalization, as very correctly put by Mr. Liras. And uh, I'm always skeptical when I hear about more regulation and more and a new order uh, coming in the EU, more uh, central government. I think it's important to note that this would be absolutely necessary in more humanitarian uh, areas, like the problem of the refugees. But uh, uh, shipping has done quite well over the years, regulating itself. Uh, it is uh, uh, an industry where its most uh, dynamic section is uh, private and entrepreneurial, and we should preserve that uh, character to the extent possible. Uh, I don't want to add anything else. I think uh, uh, the previous speakers have covered uh, most of the parts. Thank you. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, I think there is uh, Joshua Giesin who wants to make uh, a little bat ballot among all of us. Uh, Joshua is um, graduated at St. Andrews University in uh, economics and Arabic, so he will speak in uh, Arabic uh, if everybody no. understands this language. I don't think we have the translator for that here available. In particular, the, the tanker <laughs> owners, I think, would be delighted. To. Mm. 
Now I'll be very quick because obviously we're all very hungry and Federico and Mauro are very excited to get with their, start their session. But uh, the Bottiglioli family kindly donated uh, the voting machines for some audience participation, so we're very grateful to them for that. Now we've heard some really interesting and insightful presentations and speeches by everyone today and also yesterday, and I think we've all managed to think about the issues that affect the shipping industry, but also humanitarian issues such as the letter spoke about. Um, and we're all united here because of, we all work in the same industry. And the first question, if you could put on the board, please, is will the shipping industry remain as globally important in the future? Now, of course, the answer to that is yes. And I hope we, you know, feel good about that. But I ask that because in the past, shipping, the shipping industry, of course, um, provided perhaps as a percentage role more jobs and a greater sort of economic output. Whereas more recently, we have entirely new industries such as information technology, pharmaceuticals, that also provide more jobs uh, and a greater economic output proportionally, shall we say. So would you agree that even though shipping provides, um, as Thomas Rader said, 135 billion euros of economic output in the EU and over 2 million jobs, is it still as important globally now and in the future? The first question. Yes, good. And the second question is, as Giuseppe Bottiglielli was saying during his presentation, is our industry, is, of course, is so volatile. We don't know what's going to happen next year or in 18 months or in two months, in two years, sorry. And I don't think anyone expected, if you had asked them two years ago, that the tanker market would be doing as well as it is now. But what do you think will be profitable in the next one to two years? Okay. Well, I hope we can still be optimistic about dry bulk. <laughs> and then the third question, alluding to the presentation of Professor Dalimonte, is does the EU have a positive future without the need of becoming a supranational state? Okay, so I think we need to find a better way to work together from all the EU countries, I think, then. <laughs> and lastly, of course, we've heard a lot about new regulations that require investments in new technologies in order to comply with them. And so do you think, as the audience, that the EU or national governments should subsidize the implementation of new technologies in order to comply with new environmental regulations. Somewhat mixed answer, but a resounding yes, I think you could say. So thank you very much, and that concludes, I think, if Francesco wants to say anything else. Well, thank you, Joshua. I, I can see that your, um, uh, your, your, your skills have not been too damaged by your stay at Studio Legale Lauro and in Naples, a uh, city that uh, you love, apparently, more than your own uh, country. And, uh, I mean, th this is a great uh, result. I mean, you maintained uh, almost inaltered your, your, your intellectual skills. Uh, that makes me happy. Uh, and uh, so I think we are going to close this session. I don't know if uh, Emanuele wants to say a final word or just say goodbye to the next session. No, no, I think...
course, I think it was uh, extremely interesting to hear um, uh, the different positions on uh, today's table. For perhaps the only thing I want uh, <laughs> to say that uh, it is that apart from uh, uh, legis legislation or excessive regulation, I think w when we have a, a nil market, uh, we are responsible for it. We have to take responsibility because after such a long period of crisis in the sector of the bulk, to see how much orders are still there, it has to come to self-discipline. Self-discipline in scrapping the vessel and self-discipline in ordering the ship. We cannot blame somebody else or find rules on this. I think that uh, we have it imposed into ourselves because we have to look forward and uh, uh, with such a market, when the old ships will see the light at the end of this tunnel. This is what we should ask ourselves. And some people should scrap the old vessel because this will help the other ships that may own to find some light at the end of the tunnel. Sorry if I intervene in something that was, but I think that it is difficult to expect that, uh, uh, particularly because everybody will say, uh, when a ship is 30 years old, is it better a well-maintained 30-year-old vessel or it is better or worse a bad-maintained 10-year-old vessel? So there are so many issues that will be on the table that will make the matter even more complicate. But I don't want to add more and steal more time. I think we have to go for lunch. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, Emma, Emanuele. And uh, there is, uh, please, uh, don't, don't move yet. Please, please, please. Sorry, there are some announcements, please. Uh, and uh, the, the, there is, I think, light uh, at the end of the tunnel. And uh, before we can see this light and the food, uh, in a very short uh, lunchtime, because there are uh, flights to London and other parts of the world uh, waiting for the panelists of the next session. Uh, and I apologize with them with this usual uh, postponement of this session. And uh, Timio want to say a final word. Then uh, we move quickly to the food and we come back. Uh, we don't have time to eat so much, so we will be very light and uh, reactive for the next uh, session. There are two sessions in the afternoon. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Francesco. Uh, just to say that uh, the comments just made by Mr. Grimaldi and Durpin the title of this session, which is the art, the art of the art of shipping, and and uh, I would also ask uh, Francesco, who's going, who will undertake to pass to 10 Downing Street the outcome of the European Union becoming supranational state? Uh, the, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached uh, the end of uh, what I would call a stimulating and fruitful session, starting with uh, art, and move, uh, moving on into the marvels, starting with uh, art in, in the marvels of this venue and moving on to migration, European Union matters, state of the markets and rulemaking. I would like uh, to join me in thanking the speakers and the panelists for uh, a contribution which has made this a memorable session and I think we should show it to them in the usual manner.